Hi, everyone. Welcome to our past present. I'm Anna Rose, the Exhibition and Programming Associate at Vivenda. Our past present is a monthly series focused on the significance of memory and history in contemporary artwork. Today, our guest is Sishong Zia. She's an artist and cultural organizer who utilizes body-based sculptural forms, masks, costumes, objects, transforming discarded materials and disregarded spaces by using the tools of humor and absurdity. By placing traditional sculptural forms within new sites, materials, and social constructs, she investigates these forms and movements within global communities to reconsider and re-envision these spaces and performative practices. She's held a number of artist re residencies, including at the Watermill Center in Long Island, Housen Worth in Somerset, UK, Snowhegan, and Mass Mocha. In her most current exhibition, she constructed the multi-channel, multimedia installation, Do Donkeys Know Politics? Scaffold Series 1 at USC Pacific Asia Museum in Pasadena. It explores the impact of art and the fluidity of memory as a form of protection. Her practice deals with issues of identity, politics, cross-culturalism, and the surreal characteristics of her body in the ever-changing environment. Her current body of work explores Chinese culture versus American culture, her female gender versus the patriarchy that is reflected in municipal sculptures in China, and Chinese communist politics versus the, one, the only one child generation. This will be about a 45 minute between Verkir Pitian, Yu Siegel, and Si Shongzi. After that, we'll leave about 15 minutes for audience Q&A. So please get your questions ready to put in the Q&A box during that time. As always, we appreciate everyone's questions. Please keep them short, no longer than a sentence or two. <clears throat> and if you have comments that aren't questions, please use the chat box. And it's always nice to see what city you're tuning in from. And we'd like to thank Susan Horwitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting the discussion series at the Venda and our virtual programs. And now I'll hand it off to Sushong to give a short presentation. Thank you, Anna. And first of all, thank you all for inviting me to this uh, artist talk series. And uh, it's great pleasure to join you guys today. I'm gonna share my screen to briefly talk about a current project I've been working on called Do Donkeys Know Politics? So just wait a second. Okay, so this is the most uh, recent project I've been doing. It's called Do Donkey Know Politics Scaffolding Series. In this video installation, I construct a two scaffolding structure utilizing a uh, schedule 40 and uh, different construction site materials. And in this installation, you see five different videos representing five iteration of my recreation of a particular donkey cartoon my grandfather drew during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, so each video, it convenes one um, edition of my grandmother's memory. So she's my collaborator in this project. Um, every time I finish a drawing, she will critique and give me feedback on the donkey cartoon. So I will draw the second one, the third one. And this is another related project called Trinity Memory with the Disappeared. Um, so in this durational performance, um, I collaborate with two performers and myself um, creating a four hour durational work, which uh, we will consistently draw with white chalk in the landscape of House and World Somerside. Um, and then I intended to choose a raining day so the rain will wash away the, the chalk drawing slowly during the four hours. And uh, this is another project in collaboration with my family members. So as you see, the seesaw um, was constructed uh, with plywood from uh, California, embedded with my uh, collection of my father's cigarette ashes and my mother's hairballs. Um, so they were, um, they were imb embedded in each side of the seesaw. And this is a um, traditional performance I did uh, two years ago, um, which I collaborate with six performers and myself. In this performance, we constantly washing away the donkey cartoon ink on the large blanket. And uh, so 
for the viewer, they can follow us in five different groups during the whole four hours. And uh, this is another body of the work I've been doing since 2014, uh, which I which I constructed a communist Mao suit uh, with fake Louis Vuitton fabric pattern. And the location I choose to photograph myself is really uh, relate to my current life in between China and the uh, US. So uh, the photo you saw at the top of this image were the largest landfill company in my hometown in Xi'an, China. And uh, the bottom image was photographed nearby the Valencia in California. So you see the image. I'm just gonna go through this uh, short briefly. And this is a beginning point of this project, uh, which I'm mimicking the Chairman Mao statue in front of the government buildings in different city in China. Um, and I was trying to pretend I'm part of the tourists because in China, uh, a lot of people will jump and uh, doing certain gestures while taking a photo. So the security guard nearby the government building, they wouldn't bother me um, because they didn't know I'm an artist. Um, so I just brought a tripod and camera and photographed myself uh, jumping and doing the same gestures as Mao. And this is a, a really important piece um, like in 2015, which I was standing in Times Square for an hour um, holding a sign, it says I'm a Chinese citizen, $10 for taking a photo with me. Uh, and I was uh, staged this uh, performance without telling all the performers at Times Square, uh, which um, they dressed up as Statue of Liberty and uh, Disney characters. And my friends was uh, set up a stationary camera really far away from, from me. Um, so during the one hour performance, people really thought I was a part of the, uh, the group um, with Statue of Liberty and Disney characters. So people actually paid me um, in the duration of one hour to take a photo with me. And this is another project with a fake Louis Vuitton suit, uh, which I was researching different sites for famous cowboy films in California. Um, so this is one edition of that series. It's called Smile for an Hour uh, at Whisker Rocks. Um, and uh, so the, basically the idea was trying to testify how long I can smile in front of a camera. Uh, so in this video, it is one hour long and you basically see me as a still image in the foreground and uh, the clouds and bird were like slowly changing in the background. And this project called The Boat Has Sailed, hasn't it? And uh, we will talk about this project, I think, later in our conversation. So I'm just going to go through it. And this is my last slide, and it's my current work. Um, it's a one channel video, uh, which called Lake Lonely. I finished filming this project last year at a residency. And uh, there was a real lake called Lake Lonely. Um, and, uh, when I first got there, I saw the lake on the map, uh, but I never can find an, a public access to the lake. Uh, so the whole film was um, me trying to find the public access to the Lake Lonely. Um, and then I built this parachute based on the World War II um, parachute on template. And then I attached this parachute to a white bicycle. So the whole film, you will see a character um, biking with a parachute from morning to sunset. And the film is uh, around 12 minutes. Okay, that's the end of my slideshow. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thu Chong. And um, thank you so much also for being with us today. And let's start our conversation with the donkey, which is behind you. Um, it's clear that donkeys play an important role in your work. And you mentioned already your grandfather making a cartoon during the Cultural Revolution, which was published in a journal in Beijing, and then had an enormous impact uh, on his life. He was 
convicted to a labor camp. Um, his, your grandmother was forced to divorce him at that point. So um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how this story impacted you and why it play, does play such an important role in your work? Thank you for that question. Um, this drawing is important to me because I, I see it as a connection to, the, to my past family history and my personal history. So it's kind of like a post memory from, not from my generation, but from my grandparents' generation. And this project, um, it's also communicating with what's possible and impossible because um, my grandfather already passed away and I didn't learn this part of family history until he passed away three years ago. Um, that's the beginning point of this whole project. And then I start talking to my grandmother in 2017. Um, that's how we started. And then this project just kept developing into uh, different things because my grandmother is also 85 years old. So her part of memory might be lost. And uh, sometimes she, um, if you watch the video, um, she will give really different critique um, like on my drawing, like uh, from her own memories. Like, like if you compare to the fifth drawing to the first drawing. Right, so I think that's very interesting in how you make the process transparent by first uh, trying to reconstruct that drawing on what you know and what you have heard, and then adjusting it every time you um, speak with your grandmother again and she remembers other things. So apart from reconstructing the memory, it's, it seems also a kind of visualization how memory and storytelling actually works. Is that right? Yeah, it's interesting because I start thinking of how could all the documentary is not fictional because it's wrote by or direct by like a, a singular director or author. So I start think I just start questioning what is a real story happened during the 1950s and what is um, like why my grandfather was punished for such a drawing, especially as an architect for both of my grandparents, they were working closely with construction workers during that time. And because of there's a movement called Daming Da Feng, basically the government ask people to speak freely about their opinions about government. That's why he um, basically published this cartoon trying to criticizing um, like um, some governor leaders who are using public funding for private purposes. Thank you. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, you you speak. Uh, you mentioned that this that this process is really transparent in in the video, the the, the drawing and the redrawing and the critique from the grandmother, um, and it seems that there's something political about that for you as well, right? Like that that there's something important about artists revealing the labor behind their work. And I think for me, when I listen to you, that has also to do with your relationship to architecture. Um, you know, that you mentioned that your grandparents uh, were both architects and I've heard you say that you, you would like the construction workers who work on buildings to be revealed for their labor. So there's something about, there's something political about the transparency of honoring construction workers. Um, and I wonder if you think of yourself in this case as a construction worker or an architect or both in some way as you become more transparent about your process. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think uh, for my process of artistic making, I regard for both um, construction worker and architects because I, I do feel like I want to emphasize the process in making, especially um, most of my work are directional based and I do document the process really well. Some are revealed in the video. Um, so the beginning, intention was maybe not a film project, but at the end, the whole project be became a film. And uh, and uh, in a lot of installations, um, like the the one in, in my background, it's really, I'm trying to actually inspire by just absorbing how construction workers, how they work 
in different sites. And uh, so, so the scaffolding is another way as a metaphor for in process of in between because the, the scaffolding structure were never utilized for the final product or architect. So, so that's what I'm thinking. And also the, in the project, the boat has sell, hasn't it? Um, it started as a handmade seesaw boat I built. And uh, the beginning intention was a project for experimenting. And I will invite different people to join a seesaw boat right with me. And then, but at the end, it became a film. Um, so I really think um, like, I, I like this in betweenness and how you depart from somewhere and you searching for this in between space. Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about uh, the connection between uh, history and memory in your work? Because you are referencing among other things, the story of your grandfather during uh, the cultural revolution. But I think you are also pointing to possible differences between personal narratives and the official um, narrative of history as more or less controlled by the Chinese government. Can you comment on that? Yes, um, I, so like personal is political. It's a really famous quote from Taiming Ha. And uh, I do feel like in my story, in my family history context, it's really because of this really personal story, I started to further utilizing and researching this part of um, particular Chinese history, which I didn't learn from history book when I was studying in China. Um, so, and then I realized it's a really a uh, general generation history that didn't, it's basically entirely erased from history in China. Um, so many people were suffered the same way as my grandfather did. Um, so, so it's it's really painful to to think of that, uh, and especially they are being kind of like a, a secret story that you you couldn't really talk about that in public. Right. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I'm curious about um, that piece that you showed us from Times Square, in light of in light of um, a lot of the kind of um, politics of your work. Um, you stood there, you were holding this handmade sign. It said, I'm a Chinese citizen, $10 for take a photo with me and it had a happy face. Um, and then uh, 10 people I, I see paid you for a photograph. Um, and you called those people collaborators in some way, right? That, that, that they weren't just viewing your work passively but they were collaborating with you by, by paying you. Um, and I, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit uh, personally, politically uh, about what, what's the nature of that kind of collaboration? Were you, were you hoping to kind of suggest that they were in fact othering you um, or, or what, what kind of a role were you imagining they knew they were taking and what kind of a role were you, were you asking them to take? Yeah, I'm glad you point out that project because I think that's a turning point project for me as how um, I see how others reviewing me as a Asian artist uh, who basically um, like they can tell I'm not from here. So I'm immigrant to the US. So I, I also feel like during that time when I was filming at Times Square, I didn't know the chance of how many people would interact with me. So every collaborator is kind of by chance. Um, even um, in another project, Smile for an Hour, uh, if you watch the whole 60 minutes film, you will see a really random uh, person dressed as a cowboy who, who's, re <laughs> who's riding a, a horses in the, it just passed by me. And I didn't know those things gonna happen when I was filming it. So, um, so I call them collaborators. It's because I just learn from life and I absorb people. And I didn't, um, I didn't know what gonna happen during that performance at Times Square, but I did know 
and absorbed many times before I start filming that project. So I know um, those people, it's their full-time job. They go there after 6 p.m. every night to dress up and perform basically um, for the general public. Most people probably tourists uh, who, who, who went there from everywhere in the world to see Times Square at night. Um, so for me, I, when I was filming, I, did, I really didn't expect people gonna pay me. And I thought people gonna regard me as I'm doing an art performance. But actually the, the result was pretty sh shocking to me as well. Like people really paid me. Um, and, and, and also at the end of the performance, one performer, um, he actually walked up to me. Um, so, so I think it's also about humor and I, I'm thinking I'm thinking that and also in the smile for an hour, um, mm -hmm. it is a testing by um, the physicality of myself and also about the viewer, like how long they can watch a video for an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I feel like uh, I use myself a lot in my work. So uh, a lot of people will think it's about criticizing female character. Um, it, it is, yes, but at the same time, I think it's also, I'm trying to testing find how viewer will see the work. Yeah. Right. So when your jumps in front of or next to mouse sculptures are taking place in uh, public uh, spaces and uh, central and busy spaces, but as you also mentioned on your website, you have also a special interest for abandoned places and uh, uh, left behind materials. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why that is important to you? And I'm also wondering whether there might be a different approach to abandoned places and discarded materials in Chinese culture as opposed to American culture or in communism as opposed to capitalism maybe. Yeah, um, I feel like uh, for the jumping series, as the uh, first two images you see, uh, I was jumping in front of uh, the largest landfill company. Uh, so I first discovered that place um, in 2015. And during that time, I didn't know I'm going to do a project there. Uh, and then I went back in 2016 in the summer. Um, it just, the smell of it, it was just horrible. And then I start just drive there every day to absorbing like how they will um, catalog all the trash from the city. Uh, and it was just uh, really scary to watch that because they would put all the valuable stuff in the back um, and then put all other garbage under a giant plastic. Um, I, I think it's plastic, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's just like from far away in that image I captured uh, it looks like a plastic mountain to me. Uh, so I went there and started photographing. And uh, for me, I think it's also related to the robot Smith's sense, like uh, idea of sight and non sight So I'm trying to capture this part of like a re reality. I, I just see it all the time. I heard about it, like from my friend, then I would really go there and do a site visit. Um, but at the same time, I feel like it's really about like how I see them. And then I just like bring a camera and trying to document what I see. Um, and the, the, the image, it looks um, really contrasty with the natural landscape from the image, like a greeneries in California. So in my treehouse project, it's also about this contrast imagery of what's outside of my grandmother's bedroom window view, which I asked her to document from her iPhone of this really polluted view from her window because 20 years ago, um, you would see all the Qinli mountain from her window view, but now it just like uh, all the buildings are completely blocked her window view. You just see the constructions and I hear it all the time. It's it's really different experience, like in comparison to me, 
uh, like currently living and working in Los Angeles. Um, and the tree house is another metaphor, of, like I think is so interesting because in China, everybody uh, live in like 19th floor apartment and they have to take elevator to go out and greetings with their neighbors. But here it's like everyone have a yard and they their children, basically their childhood, it's really free and uh, tree house. It's kind of a metaphor for me as a fantasy for freedom. Thank you. Yeah, you work in so many different locations now. You know, you've worked in Watermill, uh, New York, and, um, and Bath uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, you've worked uh, away from China on China, and you've worked uh, away from your grandparents on the issue of your grandparents. Um, and, it, and it feels to me like, like um, uh, you know, that, that work is almost necessarily oriented around memory because you're not with those people or you're not in the places that you're depicting. So I'm, I'm curious about, you know, um, how your work changes when you're, when you're working with something that's right in front of you, um, uh, as opposed to places and people you've left or lost on some level. I think because of the distance, um, that's how this project has another layer of how we communicate through this long distance relationship. And then, and then this long process of correcting this political cartoon became the only way to communicate with my grandmother because she will like kind of crit criticizing me every week and uh, whenever, so it's still ongoing project. And uh, um, with the project with my parents of the the seesaw I built with their collective hair balls and cigarette ashes. It's really, for me, that's their portrait um, in a way because I grew up with my grandparents and uh, just like seeing, I didn't really like had a childhood memory with my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so like in me, like that's kind of captured their relationship uh, as a seesaw and also I think I use seesaw a lot in my work, actually. Yeah. Do you think it's actually important that people know that it's your family? Um, do you think it would work otherwise if they didn't for some reason? Yeah, it's really important uh, for people to know that the materiality. I always list uh, like what I used because I think it's really important. Um, they know that's my mom's hair, falling hair balls, and and my dad's cigarette ashes. I would uh, like to ask you, Su Chong, about another concept that seems to be very central to at least some of your works, and that is the idea of loneliness. So you have a work with the title With, with Treehouse, Alone, Alone. You did uh, the Lake Lonely project. I think um, loneliness plays a central part in The Boat Has Sailed, hasn't it? And I'm wondering how you uh, conceive of that idea of loneliness, because there is such a different approach to it, I feel, in Chinese culture as opposed to American culture. Chinese culture with its focus and emphasis on togetherness and social purpose, and American society with its emphasis on individualism. So how do you experience these different types of uh, loneliness? Um, is the one more important to you than the other? Do you mix them in your work? How, how do you see that? It's really interesting you point out the different type of loneliness um, in comparison to like the Eastern and uh, Western culture. Um, because based on my experience of growing up in China, I went to boarding school since um, my elementary school. So I didn't have uh, I have a lot of togetherness with my peers as I was uh, living like basically on campus uh, most of times and then just spending my weekends with my family. Um, but in a way, it is kind of like a general trend during my generation um, as um, my parents were really busy working um, when I was young. Uh, so. I think it's a different type of loneliness because my interaction with my family members are actually 
less than my interactions with my classmates and teachers. Um, so in a way, it's really different than my experience being in the U.S. in the last 10 years. Um, I feel, I feel really, actually, I think because of this distance, I feel more close to my family in a way. Um, and uh, I, I think the, the individualism here, uh, I totally get it, but I, I, I actually, it, it's interesting. I didn't feel that much a difference because maybe because uh, I always really easy to adapt to a new environment. Um, and I, I think for the different residencies, it, it just, I feel as an artist, it, you just always have to be alone in the studio walking. I think that's the only way I can be like, like pr productive to, to think, to make. Um, I have, I, I, I didn't really think of like, there's any other way I can make like uh, productions if I'm not like, always around people. Yeah, I think it's also because of artists, um, it, it just, I, I, I never felt, especially during this pandemic, I didn't really feel a difference because even before this, I always walk alone in studio, so. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's interesting. When, when I think back to that performance in Times Square again, um, and that, the fact that the Statue of Liberty walked up to you afterwards and said, hey, you know, if you do this for three years, you can get a green card. Um, <laughs> and, and when I heard you tell that story before, I, um, it made me wonder if that made you feel like you belonged, you know, like this was a community of performers in Times Square and you belonged with them, or if it made you feel like an outsider, uh, you know, in a world that you know, necessitates documents and all these kinds of official signifiers of belonging and stuff. Um, so, uh, so, so, yeah. What, what, I, as an artist, as a person, as a, as a person uh, who had come to this country, how did that make you feel when he offered you the green card option? <laughs> Uh, he he actually he didn't say I if I perform he actually said if you stay in the states for three years uh, you know you can get a lawyer and apply for green card <laughs> and, and it's interesting like he's he mentioned that to me um, because during that time I didn't have any intention um, and and then but like during that time I just I have really mixed feelings about that because some performers like um, that person he's really friendly to me and he's trying to ask me why am i doing that and he's trying to understand why i'm doing that um mm -hmm. but some um people i'm not sure they are tourists or local people when they pass by me they just yelled at me said oh you are so weird and and they just <laughs> yelled at me um and some people they were just criticizing, telling me, oh, you shouldn't be here because you don't have any costumes. Um, so it's really a mixed feelings, like when I was doing that. Um, but I, I do feel like right now, especially during the pandemic, I do feel like I don't belong to anywhere. It's kind of like um, this nomadic, like belonging in a way um, I am, from China, but I also based in here for so many years. Um, it, it's hard to see um, where I can fit into. So my work is kind of like healing me in a way. I'm discovering this in betweenness in my work, especially the boat project and Lake Lonely. Thank you. I think this is a good moment to have a look at the Q and A box and. Please, if you have questions, put them there, you know, the Q&A, that is where we are looking. And Tefera, do you want to pick one? Um, let's see, we've got a couple. Um, so, um, well, first of all, Rose Dosti just wants to know a, a bit about your own personal background in China and the US and your training as an artist. So we know that you went to boarding school in China um, and that you've done these various residencies internationally, but is there anything else you can describe about your training and your, um, and your background that would help? 
understanding. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. I I went to a really traditional art school in China for my undergrad, which I was trained as an oil painter and illustrator um, for four years. And then I, I would say like a one a really inspiring residency I did was a watermill center. Uh, I did twice their residency in the summer of 2016 and 17, which I I learned a lot from Robert Watson, how he direct um, and how he interact and collaborate with different people who are non like professional actors or actress. Um, so I, I learned a lot from that, especially like one quote from him. It's like, there's none thing, it's silent. So everything is non silent you just have to listen and and so so i learned a lot from him not only the way how he used um like duration and time in his work but also how he regard art from life and um, because um in one of his performance he just absorb how people walk and then he will invite totally strangers from the street to ask him or her on stage um, so that's, I, I wouldn't say that's an educational like background, but I, I just feel like that's like a really, I was inspired by. And also being in the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture it was really transforming my practice in a way I see so many artists from just totally different background and how they make work and, and which is different than what I learned from art school. And I went to graduate school at CalArts and graduated in 2017. Okay. Another question is from uh, Bruce Hollihan. Do you have any further ideas about the fanciful juxtaposition of the sacred and the profane, the profound and the banal, and where might your dreams take you? And also, are you concerned that the state might misunderstand your creations? Um, could you be more like specific about that question? Yeah, so I think the second question is uh, if you fear that in China you might get into uh, difficulties with the authorities based on your work. And the first, uh, well, let's start there. Let's start there. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I think like with jumping serious, I never. Um, would tell people I'm an artist doing that project for my artwork. Um, I think that's a one way to to do that to protect my family. Especially now I'm living abroad, but my my family members are still in mainland China and working for the government. So I think one way to protect them is just to stay away from from them. And also, I think for me, it's just more freedom to recreate this drawing because I just really want to know what that drawing looked like as a way to communicate with my grandfather who already passed away. Right, thank you. And the first part of the question was um, if you have specific ideas about the juxtaposition of the sacred and the profane or the profound and the banal. So I'm not sure uh, what the exact reference is here. Yeah. You know, it makes me think about, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what he meant, but, but it, um, you know, there are some things that you do that are, um, that are, uh, you know, um, really banal, right? Like smiling, it's a, it's a really normal thing to do. And then there are other things um, about that work that that are transcendent, like the landscape behind you, um, or or the kind of profundity politically of of Mao's uh, posture and the kind of banality of the tourist jump, right? So I think he's asking if there's if there's more to say there about the the juxtaposition of those two kind of edges. Um, <laughs> of um, representation. Yeah, um, I, I, I see. And I, I feel like it's definitely like I was inspired by absorbing how tourists, they act in front of the statue of Mao and the government. 
And also, I think it's bizarre to to see um, like the security in front of the the statue. They were so they were standing there like a statue, and you cannot like you you are not allowed to staring them in front of them or take a photo of them. So my intention to start photographing was really trying to be playful with it. What if I jump and pretend I'm a tourist and taking those photos? And then the re result was, in fact, I was really, uh, they didn't really say anything to me or like forbade me to do that. So that, that was the beginning of that. And the reason that whole project switched to uh, me jumping with a Chairman Mao suit with a fake Louis Vuitton was uh, from the Times Square performance because that person asked me why you are not wearing a costume like why are you here um, are you making a living based on this so because I started thinking of um, what if I wear something so people regard me as a costume and then I started thinking of how I can transform um, this costume originally from Mao suit a, a really specific communist Mao outfit into something I see like the, the the landfill if you like look from far away the texture of the trash mountain kind of looks like a Louis Vuitton um, logo to me like like it's just like a brownish um, gray color so that's how I think of like also like from my observation in China many people they would buy fake Louis Vuitton belt or purse just to represent, oh, they are maybe from upper class. It, it, it's really interesting because Louis Vuitton became like a, a symbol for class in China, but it's such a like a Western commercial idea. Um, and then I found this company on eBay, they produce like fake Louis Vuitton fabric for really like cheap price. So that's how I start the second series of jumping. And then I didn't go to the, the where the real statue of uh, Chairman Mao. I, I, instead, I tried to find this contrast between really natural landscape, um, but you can pick on um, some like like pagodas actually were being or in process of destroyed by the government. I think it's very humoristic how you use this Louis Vuitton uh, logo on a Mao suit. Can you tell us why you decided to um, work with a male suit and not a female one? I, I think that uh, because I'm trying to get the same um, layer of the, the first series of jumping, which I was mimicking Mao statue. Um, so I want to bring that sense from Mao statue, but the way I was jumping on the fake Louis Vuitton Mao suit series, uh, I was trying to bring that heavy, um, but at the same time, the gravity, of course, you, you see that, um, but I want to bring that heaviness into like the landfill background or somewhere you see like a, a pagoda from Ming Dynasty, but it's being <clears throat> being destroyed in process. So I want to bring that type of gravity and heavy, heaviness um, from the Mao suit. And also during that time, I, I it's it just like a, a really, everybody get that similar style of suit. Thank you. So it's not a gendered suit actually, you mean? Yeah. But I designed that suit based on the same as the Chairman Mao suit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, do you feel that there is some symbolic connection between your upbringing as part of the one child generation uh, and your interest in body-based art, integrating yourself into the artwork? Yeah, I I think the only one child generation can relate to the loneliness, um, especially the Lake Lonely. Um, also, it relates to the process of how I make that work. 
um, because I was a camera person, performer, and sound sound person for that whole film. So I feel like, um, in a way, I really enjoyed to produce all aspects or stage of one project on myself if I could, um, especially during this time. Um, but like for, what's the second question? Um, um, she was asking, um, basically, if uh, if the the reason if 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 being part of that generation influenced the fact that you use your body so much um, in in the work yourself, and also the kind of physicality, the yeah, the fact that it's it's um, it's physical performance, um, it's it's the body that's being used, and your body in particular. So there might be some inflection in that question around um yeah not only the fact that you were you you were an only child but maybe other issues of female infanticide or you know anything mortal or physical i see um i will give you a really personal example of like physicality uh with how i grew up in a boarding school so I remember really clearly um, in my, I think it was in my elementary school. And uh, one time I was late to school just for like 10 minutes. And my my teacher asked me to stand uh, in the hallway outside of our classroom for the whole afternoon. That's probably like a duration of four hours. So I just like, I think there's so many disciplines, not only for female, but also everybody in China like with how it's just super disciplined and we have to wear uniform all the time on campus and we cannot have like it's it just so many rules like you cannot have long nails and, and uh, long hair it, it's they want everything to be unified I didn't really see a connection between um, that discipline with my work but now since I think smell for an hour, it's really like, I, I, I definitely see a connection. Like, like a, I, in order to stand there for that long, I, I think it's just like, I, I trained that way, I guess, like with the education, yeah. Right, now I, I guess uh, maybe the question was also inspired uh, by the fact that you mentioned the one child policy on your website and that it influenced your work. So yeah. But, uh, Thank you for this uh, interesting example. We have a question from Lorraine Petzella. Well, while you were taking the photos imitating the Mao statues, did you notice any of the reactions of people who were watching you? And did you receive any disapproving looks from people? Yes, all the time. Like, um, <laughs> like especially in front of the, 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 ch the Chairman Mao statue, um, but because uh, I was not the only one doing that, many tourists would do the same thing. So I would say people kind of like, it's a different environment, I would say. But like in, for example, for the landfill um, picture, I was there alone and, uh, and uh, there's not many people walking there and they just doing their work. Nobody was around me. Also, it was smelling horrible. So many locations um, I choose for, to photograph was really, um, you can see as dangerous or nobody was around there. Right. Thank you. We have a few uh, comments by Mauricio Alacon Morales, who says, thank you, your art is very inspirational particularly the Faux Vuitton's juxtaposition with China's cultural heritage. And he also says, I haven't had so much insight on the one child generation since I saw the film The Farewell by director Lulu Wang. So, nice. He also mentioned, if we have time for one brief question, same, the same uh, guest mentioned in the chat, a question about how your message has evolved over time. It might be a nice uh, question to end on, actually. Yeah, that's a great question. I always think about time and space in my work. Um, and uh, I'm actually working on a new project in the Death Valley National Park, um, which I've been weaving a really long 
soft leather with loom at home. Um, and so far it's like a 12 meters long. So that with time duration, it's like since the pandemic. So it's last seven months, um, actually more than seven months. Um, and uh, I'm trying to film in the new year uh, in the Death Valley. So I, I think the time, the duration of last eight months with weaving this soft leather, um, it's really inspiring me to think of what I'm trying to film in the future. And I did um, two set with it at the national park um, in the last three months. So, so in a way I think of time really, it's just like focusing on what I'm doing and weaving it uh, as a way to inspire me to further develop. Maybe it could be a film, maybe it's a, a photograph. I just, I don't know yet. I think that's a great uh, point um, to conclude uh, this interview by this open perspective. Uh, Sichuan, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, conversation. You really um, made the point that the personal is political, but also the personal is artistic. But thank you so much for that. Thanks. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I'm so glad to having a conversation with you both. Yeah. Great, thank you. So our, uh, we will have a little break now in the Wednesday interview series. Our next one is January 13th in the series Cold War Spaces. And my guest will be um, uh, Paul Betts, professor of uh, European history at Oxford University, who just recently published a book about uh, reconstructing Europe after the Second World War. So hope to see you in the next year. And uh, Vera, I'm sure I'm also speaking in your name, and I uh, wish everyone very happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays. Happy holidays.